everybody, welcome to another episode of the Atlantic Soap Podcast. I'm here with a person I've heard wonderful things about, and I'm excited to finally get to do this with him, John McLaren, who has an outstanding background in social services and addiction. And I just want to get this started right away by letting him introduce himself. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Donald. Uh, uh, my name is John McLaren. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I practice out of uh, Northfield. I have a small private practice. I was a, a former director for the Department of Family and Community Development for Atlanta County, uh, working with homelessness and individuals at risk of being homeless, most of whom were mentally ill and or substance dependent. And I also worked at the Atlanta County Jail for about eight years in, in the same role, uh, helping inmates come and exit to, uh, to the community. And also while they're incarcerated, we, we did a lot of treatment in terms of treating people with, with substance use disorders as well. That's awesome. So that's what I really wanted to focus on today's topic, substance use disorder and addiction. So I'm just going to throw the floor to you. What, what, do you. what are some things you wish people knew when they're dealing with people with addiction or living with people with substance use disorder? Kind of what, was, what is the one thing you wish that people would understand more? That it's really not a choice. And unfortunately, that seems to working with a lot of family members, family members get very frustrated because they believe their loved one is, is actually choosing to, uh, you know, stick a needle in their arm, or, you know, if it's, if it's uh, opioids and intervene issues or uh, guzzle down vodka, if it's alcohol is the, is the drug of choice. But truthfully, it, it really is the neuroscience of addiction. You know, the brain is simply craving it so desperately and so badly that that level of comfortability in the person is so intense that they typically just fall vulnerable to going back to the drug because it's the only substance that gives them a sense of normalcy after a while. You know, so many years their brain has been conditioned to having that drug. So I think a lot of parents and loved ones, partners, husbands, wives are led to the belief that, that this person just woke up in the morning and is, is choosing to go back to the drug that, that had got them impaired. But if you think about it, I mean, it, who, who would want to return to a life if your life on substances is, is causing all this distress, like going to being incarcerated, uh, being evicted, losing jobs, lo- losing relationships, going through extensive litigation during divorces? Who would realistically want to want to follow that life? I mean, it's not you're not following a glamorous life. You're, ta- you're talking about a life of desperation, heartache and, and simply a lot of emotional pain. So to answer your question, Donald, it would probably be um, trying to educate parents that, you know, your, your, your loved one really does have a brain disease. Yes, and I think that's a, a, a real important point because people do, I mean, there's been some progress in that area, but you're right. People think it's like they could just turn off a light switch, like, oh, just don't mm-hmm. drink or just don't use the substance that's making you addicted, but it's more complicated than that. And how much of it, how much of addiction is, genetic versus kind of learned behavior do you can you speak on that like how much control yeah, what, does what a great really question have? what what a great question there's been an enormous shift in in the causation causality theory as as to what really does cause addiction when when a person consumes alcohol or other drugs so you you're right it was a genetic model for many many years at one point we used to be able to say well, you know, Bobby's mother was alcoholic and his father was also alcoholic. So clearly Bobby's going to turn out alcoholic because he's inherited those genes from his mother and father. And as time marched on, it, it's, it's taken a more of a evolutionary approach, meaning that the causation and causality is typically looked at like a child in a family where alcohol is used pretty freely and liberally, that what the person does is really just kind of mimic the behavior of the mother or the father who are else is living in the in the household. So there's more of a more more of a stronger concentration at looking at family history, not so much from the genetic concept, but more so from the concept of just being constant exposed to alcohol being the drug of choice. If if that is the drug. You know, many, many families use alcohol in addition to a multitude of other drugs. But it, it's less and less emphasis on genetics and more and more emphasis on learned behavior. So it's pretty interesting as that, as that kind of model has changed because in 1957, when the American Medical Association declared alcoholism a disease, it was very, very controversial because up to that point, people saw it simply as a mental health disorder. Who would guzzle you know, a quart of vodka 
you know, and and in in in, in the range of normalcy that, that someone would do that and would get completely impaired and not go to work with three children and a wife that was caring for the family. So the concentration really was on men at that time in 57 when the AMA said it's a disease. But if you really read the extensive research behind that, many of the physicians that voted for that still didn't quite see it as a bona fide disease. They still saw it as a mental health disorder. The reason why the AMA did that was they wanted men at that time were the heads of households and very few women were working. There was a relationship the women were typically caring for the children. So as, as a result, the AMA was trying to get men to go into treatment. Specifically at that time, Alcoholics Anonymous was, was, the, was the first line of, 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 of choice to just kind of, if you will, save the family. So as, as time marched on, as I mentioned, that the evolutionary process and kind of the learned behavior model became much more prominent. So when you talk to people today about what they think caused it, They'll tell you typically anxiety and depression or uncontrolled depression or uncontrolled anxiety, but you have to go one level closer after that to determine like what's causing the, dep the depression, what's, what's causing the anxiety. And, and, and probably seven out of 10 times, there's, there's some level of trauma. And you got to remember, Donald, trauma can be measured much more than just physically assaulted. It, it can be sustained neglect as well. So children that have been neglected over a long period of time, for example, typically exhibit substance use disorders behavior. And, and as a result, it's just, just simply being neglected because if your parent or the person who's assigned to care for you is not expressing any love and support, um, it's a very dark place to be. And alcohol that, and other drugs fills that hole. That's a great point. I love that point about trauma because people do define trauma quite narrowly, you know, I'm sure you meet people that go, actually, my house was fine. You know, there was no physical violence or anything like that. But then, like you say, you got to dig a little deeper and maybe they felt disconnected from their caregiver or parent or whoever that is. So, and I loved your point. I loved all this, but about, you know, I think it's important to remember that people are, are using substances for, to cope with something usually, <laughs> you know, they're not just doing it for fun. They're doing it you know, because there's some sort of anxiety or something going on. So that's important to understand too. You know, like I think sometimes you hear people go, I don't understand why anyone would use those substances. But like, at least in my experience, if you talk to people who are having those issues, it actually does make sense why they would use it. It's certainly not the best thing for them to do, but it's pretty logical. Would you agree with that? Like, it makes sense. They're trying to deal with something. Yeah, I think the non the non addicted person or the individual that doesn't understand addiction is very baffled by the concept of like why would a person with a cirrhotic liver, I mean a, a liver that has cirrhosis, um, you know, the person would be in, in danger of, of dying if they injected more to and toxins into their body, but yet they do, you know. So I mean, you know, obviously some people would be very baffled by that and saying it absolutely makes no sense. It's illogical. These individuals need to be committed. I mean, they, they've lacked the capacity to make good judgments. But yet, if you if you think about the brain disease concept again, the brain is craving these drugs. I mean, more so than like, it overrides all logic and reasoning that anyone can think of. It, the, the brain is the central uh, organ in our body that actually controls, of course, what we do. But the brain is craving it, and it, it wins. And so the person succumbs to the alcohol. I'm just using alcohol as a as an easier example, because please, there's, there's many other types of drugs that people are dependent on other than just alcohol. But the person will just crave the drug because it brings them back to that sense of normalcy again. It calms them down. It, it, it gives them that equilibrium that they're, they're searching for the entire time. Uh, they feel kind of like disconnected if they don't have the drug in their system. Right. In that short term, it allows them to function. So what would you yeah, advise? Go ahead. No, the short term, but you know, what's really interesting is that even the treatment models are kind of following different ways of getting well now. I mean, for years it was, you had to be abstinent from the drug. And now what you're finding is more and more rehab centers are including harms reduction as, an, as another method of getting well. So if, if someone really can't abstain from the drug or has tried multiple times to go into an abstinence-based model to remove the drug completely from your system, like methadone is a really good example of, of what's used as harms reduction for individuals who are dependent on opioids for, for, their, for, for, their, for their drug. And, and, that, and, that, and that gets very, very baffling after a while as well. 
So harm reduction would be just not, just so people understand, just not doing it like cold turkey. Like, I don't know. How would you explain it for people who don't know? Yeah, let me explain it. So the, the example I gave with regard to, I think the, the methadone with an opioid would be the better example. Because really what you're doing with methadone is you're giving a person who's addicted to heroin a synthetic op- opioid. I mean, methadone is equally as addicting. It makes no sense to the average person on the street because why are you giving the person another drug which is, which is equally as addicting as, as an opioid? And then the reason is that because you're quelling the brain's quest to get the drug in the system. The person can actually function on methadone. They can go to work. They can, they can, earn, they can earn income. So you're, you're delaying or preventing uh, any, any level of homelessness. Uh, the person can be gainfully employed, so the person has a, uh, a, a private insurance plan that can continue. The relationship, you know, can, can flourish and prosper uh, because the person can function very well on methadone. But uh, unfortunately, the downside of that is the person is dependent on the methadone. They would have to go into a detox to come off the drug. But many, many people now are staying on methadone 5, 10, 15, 20 years because they're finding that they just couldn't abstain from heroin or other opioids, and they couldn't function without it. They just could not function. So harm right. reduction is becoming more recognized as a bona fide treatment pro- uh, program. All right. Well, that makes sense. And that's, you know, and that's part of, I think, kind of like what you talked about with the history, the evolution of our thinking of not only is this a disease, but maybe maybe quitting it cold turkey isn't the best option for a lot of people or a realistic option for some people. And that maybe you got to work with what you have a lot of. You brought up opioids and you're right. I know we were talking about alcohol, but I know that especially in the last 20 years, 10 years, we've had a serious opioid addiction crisis in this country. And as somebody who's worked in this field a lot, I wanted to kind of ask you your thoughts on that and see how, what you think about kind of how that all happened, like the evolution of that and what your experiences has been dealing with this country's situation with opioids. Well, unfortunately, there is no more heroin on the streets. When I say unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not that I'm pro-heroin by any, by any means. But what I am saying is that it's, it's all fentanyl now. So the danger is when someone buys what they think is heroin, invariably it's fentanyl which is a, a, mul- a very, very, very potent uh, opioid. It just happens to be very, very cheap. So that's why it's, it's being imported from uh, a multitude of different countries and being funneled into this country. You know, when you talk to the people that, that, that buy heroin on the street, you know, they try to take a small chip of the drug now because they know how potent it is. But, you know, it's like, it's like gauging a dosage with, when you have no idea how potent the drug is in the first place. But it's not heroin anymore. It's, it's unfortunately fentanyl. And that's happening with synthetic drugs that people are buying off the web and things like that. They're, they're filled with this toxin called, called fentanyl, which is such a strong, very, very, very potent opioid. It's just that it's so cheap to manufacture, that's why it's being substituted for heroin. So you can get the euphoric effect, but many, many people, um, unfortunately, will die in overdose because they just there's no dosing instructions, of course, that come with a street drug. But more importantly, you have no idea how potent the drug is because there's nothing to compare it to anymore because it's, it's, it's a drug that we're, we're not accustomed to seeing, but it's saturated in this country at this point. Yeah, and this brings an interesting topic, somewhat controversial, but I wanted to get your opinions on it because I read a lot and I think about this. Like, what are your opinions on kind of drug policy, like legalization versus kind of the war on drugs and has that been counterproductive? And would legalization or decriminalization be better? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, and if you don't, oh, I have strong, six very, other very, questions. Very, but, strong, uh, very strong thoughts on that. Um, if you look at some of the European countries, and particularly the Scandinavian countries, Sweden and Norway have really, and so has Great Britain, I mean, they, they've led the fight against drug addiction by simply normalizing it. They recognize that Someone who's addicted to opioids is going to probably commit multi- multitude of crimes, a multitude of stealing taking place, a multitude of may- maybe f- uh, physical assault in order to get someone's wallet or pocketbook or, or purse, a lot of stealing, just in theft in general. So they've noticed that when they actually give away the drug, and the way that's simply done is if you're an opioid-dependent person, you would go to your local pharmacy in, in, in one of those countries, you're, you're even pre-registered. 
you, you would get the dosage that you were at when you first tried to stop. And you'd also get a, get a, a free syringe. And you would do that every day. You would just come into the pharmacy and, and pick up your drug and, and shoot it because it, it would satisfy your brain's needs. Now, the downside is, is that people are saying you're promoting and encouraging uh, dr- drug addiction, and I'm certainly not encouraging it. The person is already pre-addicted. But what, what the upside really is, is, is that crime goes down by 700%. You know, uh, fault of crime, uh, crime against individuals, crime against children, crime, just crimes in general just go down. The, it, it's remarkable because people aren't stealing to get the drug because it's given to them. And right. it's just a good investment. It's good policy. Right. It's a good trade-off if you're going to make the trade-off. It is. I mean, you got to remember that crime is going down. So other people who are not addicted are not adversely impacted by by individuals that are that are out there trying to scrounge up the money to buy another bag of dope. You know, they can right. go to the it, pharmacy, get it for free, and they know what they're getting. They're not getting fentanyl. They're actually getting heroin. So right. the, the person can function on it. Yeah. That's a great point. And it's probably less stigmatized because it's just more regulated and more not accepted by society, but more more less uh, punitive by society is a better way to put it. That's a good way of phrasing it. Well, it, is, it is less punitive. I mean, European <laughs> countries are actually decades ahead of us in, our, in terms of progressive thinking on a multitude of different topics as well. So it, it blends in very, very uh, nicely with their culture. And, and no one yeah. sees the addicted person as, as being flawed or disordered. They just see a person struggling like the best, like the rest of us are struggling to get through another day sometimes. Right, which I think is is key. One of the things that I wanted to touch on that I like that you brought up, like I said at the beginning, was kind of the importance of mental health in mm-hmm. addiction. So is that, really, is that really the source of a lot of people's substance use issues? Like, uh, yes. That's the key to it, really, unlocking good yeah, mental health. You're not, you're not assessing for depression and anxiety and other forms of mental illness when you're doing a substance use evaluation, then you're, then you're actually incompetent in what you're doing. <laughs> uh, you, know, you, you really need to include those factors because, you know, an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old just doesn't grow up and, and frankly, just, you know, want, want to drink a beer. There's a reason for why they had that first beer. Now, it could be curiosity in the beginning, but after a while, when dependency takes place and they just keep, you know, drinking and drinking despite the consequences, yeah, then, then I mean, then obviously something is triggering that. And unless you explore what that is, you're not going to treat the substance use disorder. Yeah, I think that's so key. And I think, you know, we talk a lot about mental health, but it really is the key to everything, um, to dealing with everything. It's kind of the beginning of everything if it's not handled correctly it leads to a lot of issues and can you talk about still the stigma that surrounds mental health like i feel like we still treat yeah. you know like if i had a visit like i have cerebral palsy if you have a physical thing people are more right. still tolerant about it but if you have a mental thing people still use that very punitive like get over your depression deal with it yeah. you know stuff yeah. like that extremely, extremely common it's so interesting you know when i talk to people in the office about their medication, um, they're they're very open in talking about the antihypertensives to control blood pressure or diabetic medication to control diabetes. But if you say something like, you know, should I call your primary uh, to, to consider maybe a serotonin uptake inhibitor to treat the depression, they they back off very quickly and they'll say, well, that's that's for mental health. That's a mental health medication. It's like, yeah, it's like it's psychotropic. So it's, it's a classification. It's called psychotropic medication. It's so interesting because the, the people will look at you like, you know, do, do, do I look crazy to you? It's like, no, not at all. You look like a person that's going through depression. Um, right. you, that doesn't make you crazy. It just makes you having a, a chemical imbalance that's, that's being caused by something that we have to search a little further to define. But when you go into those classifications of medications that might be beneficial for the person, it's, it's remarkable. They, they just feel very, very um, like judged almost for a moment. Like, am I really that bad? It's like, no, you're symptomatic of, of depression. Right, so right. Just like if you fell on the floor and you broke your arm, you'd be symptomatic of pain from breaking your arm. You right. know, it, it, it falls along the very, the, the identical same process. It's just a different medication. It treats something very different. Just because you can't see depression doesn't make depression any less severe. 
Right. And nobody would say, what's wrong with you for breaking your arm if you went to the hospital? Like nobody, like, it's just weird how culturally we, uh, yeah. you know, we, we view certain things. So what should be, if you have somebody you love with addiction or substance abuse issues, how, how should you handle that, that? And how much of it, and it is the tough question too, how much of it is really your, uh, like how much can you really do? Because I think sometimes we overestimate kind of those of us on the outside, the, the impact that we can have sometimes. Like if I just said well, you know, this or if I just finished this, yeah. Well, you, know, you can always start with your primary, you know, I'm, I'm big at contacting primary physicians all the time. You know, I, I just think if you're treating someone, whether it be depression or anxiety, that you really need to, to involve their, their primary so that when they see their physician, you, you can, that, that person is aware that they, they have uh, either depression, anxiety, or a multitude of other disorders so that, um, you know, that the medication is being prescribed to help reduce the symptoms. So that the, there's this whole coordinated effort to help the person get well, not just splintered in one direction and the other person's not privy to what's, what's taking place. But I wanted to emphasize, Donald, that there's a lot of public subsidies out there for substance use disorders. Like when I worked for the county, I was really, we had, a, we, had we got a lot of chapter one, what's called chapter 51. Um, chapter 51 money is money from the Division of Addictions in Trenton that pays for a detox treatment and rehab treatment for any individual that's simply low income. And low income is very broadly defined. Like you won't see a set of numbers that you have to fall into. If you make the call and that the, if, the, if the person doing the assessment, you know, understands that you're just simply low income, then you're entitled to get one of these subsidies. And that would pay for the entire treatment, including medical detoxification, all medical care up to including, you know, uh, 20 to 25 days in, in, in patient as well. And then it would also pay for the aftercare coming out, going to maybe intensive outpatient or doing groups, for example, um, along with a certified alcohol drug counselor. So there is a lot of money pumped into it. In fact, I, I've been asked to be on a committee with the, uh, with the county starting August the 5th. Uh, the opioid money is trickled down from all the lawsuits against the pharmaceutical companies that were pretty liberal in, in convincing doctors to dispense opioids to people. There's a lot of money that's coming down to all the counties and states. So, you know, the job of the committee is going to be how this money should be sent, be spent, you know, most wisely to help individuals of Atlanta County that are adversely impacted by opioid dependency. So there's another whole source of funding coming down very shortly, um, which will be distributed to the counties and the cities and the states, which is very exciting because like, um, you know, no one, there, there'll be no, no answers that no, no one will have to listen to. There is no funding available. No one should have to listen to. Um, I, I can't afford it because it should be affordable because of all the subsidies, even in the, in the welfare system, people on public assistance receiving like general assistance, single people who are receiving public assistance and mothers and fathers with dependent children called TANF, T-A-N-F, temporary assistance for needy families. Um, the counties all have a lot of money for both behavioral health and substance use abuse. So if we recognize, for example, that, our, that someone in, in, in the Workforce New Jersey activities, uh, and a welfare today is called Workforce New Jersey in our state, because it's all about getting the person to go to work if they're able to go to work. So if one of the barriers might be substance use or one of the other barrier might be ment mental health, depression and anxiety specifically, there's free treatment by licensed clinicians. I mean, the GA worker, which is the general assistance worker, like in Atlantic City, would just simply make a phone call to Pleasantville and would schedule that person for an evaluation, which would be in a couple of days. That person would go in and get a, get a full treatment, you know, for the, for the first, for the next 30 days on how to get off the drug, how to, how to uh, stay off the drug, and more importantly, how to function back into life you know, up to and considering working if, in fact, they have the capacity to go to work. So the same applies for, for the behavioral health side of it as well. Someone is, is experiencing some, some diagnosis or some type of symptom, which precludes them from participating in work-first activities. Then they're going to be, they're going to actually be on, be deferred and they, and they won't have to participate. And then they'll be taking the, the permanent disability route. So we'd be going the SSI route or the SSD route to help that person stabilize. So it doesn't always have to be work, but it, you first have to demonstrate or we, the clinician has to demonstrate or suspect that there is some serious disability that would preclude the person from working 
And then we would go the route of helping the person get on permanent disability. Well, that's a great point, John. So there are a lot of resources available, and I think sometimes people don't know it. And like you said, there's always people are used to those answers, and there's not funding for that at this time, or you know, there's funding, but the wait list is closed, like all those type of um, answers. But there are resources out there now. So what should a person do if they're looking for help? Should they just call the like county social services that's building? Is that that's such a great question because I get that all the time. You know, I would say if the person has a primary physician, then they, they on the back of their car is a toll-free number. They can just call the insurance company, even if it's Medicaid, and ask Medicaid to send them a list of all the providers who accept Medicaid that treat the whatever the disorder is they want to get treated. So that would might be the first thought, uh, step. Or, or speak to their physician. The physician has a list or the PA has a list. The lar- larger healthcare centers like Atlantic Care, and I include Jewish Family Services in that because it's, it's a very large organization that does a great job in helping persons who are at risk of homelessness and also who are also experiencing homelessness. They, they too, also have outpatient care in their offices in Margate, and Atlantic Care has at, at least in a dozen locations throughout Atlanta County, they have outpatient. So if you were to call like at their access center, which is uh, 609-646-9159, the Atlanta Care Access Center could put them in contact with maybe the Federally Qualified Healthcare Center, which is a federally funded uh, clinic, which which many physicians and PAs and APNs work in uh, to provide not only primary health care but also behavioral health and substance use at absolutely no cost at all to the patient. Um, they'd also get the person on Medicaid so they can continue their treatment and, and maintain a true kind of continuity of care. So there is there are a lot of subsidies out there that I don't think I think people just don't think are there. It might take a couple phone calls, but but they will get there if they um, if they just remain a little bit persistent. Yeah, that's a real key, John. I know it's tough uh, for people, especially when you're dealing with substance use, but you know, as somebody who's dealt with, you know, government agencies and a lot of things, I think persistence is really key. You got to keep advocating for yourself the best you can. And there are a lot of resources out there, but you got to make that phone calling and not only ask for help, but continue to follow up to make sure you get it. And I know that's a lot more easier said than done, but that really is key, I think. Well, you could also apply for, you can also contact the, you know, the, the county offices at 345-6700 and just ask the operator for like the substance abuse unit or the mental health, mental health administrator. And those individuals would easily be able to guide the person directly to a direct care as well. So uh, although that's limited to Monday through Friday, um, there is a 2 on one number that was, that was administered by United Way that it's a, just an informational number that, that people will look up n- names and addresses of organizations that can that can better assist the person depending upon what they're looking for. Yeah, and th- that's a great point. And what would you, what about, not, not, that's a great uh, strategy for somebody who's going through something. What about somebody in a situation with somebody who's got a substance use issue, their loved one has a substance use issue, I'm sorry, but they're they're not interested in getting help at this point. What would what would be your advice to that person? Yeah, you know? that's a great. That's, that's very common, by the way. I get a lot of calls from mothers and fathers, you know, that want their adult child to to get well, but the adult child doesn't want to get well. So what I normally uh, would do is I I would talk to the to the person who is adversely impacted if they, if they'll talk to me, and it's a very gradual process of just using a motivational interviewing technique to try to get them to be a little more engaged. If I can get the person just to try meeting with one person or just two people, schedule an appointment for them, you know, that it's, it's sometimes it works out really nicely that the person just feels like someone really cares about me and they'll, and they'll check into treatment um, when it's particularly when they realize that they don't have to pay anything for it and it is completely free. But you're right. That seems to be, that's always a difficult thing. If, if, if the addicted person absolutely unequivocally says, no, I'm not going, you can't do it, you can't make me, they're probably right. You, you can't. You can't really make a person yes. go to treatment, and, and, the, and they're not going to benefit from that if, if they really are not motivated to go. But um, that, that is a perplexing issue that uh, I face all the time. Yes. You so know. Keep trying. 
keep trying because it might you might break through eventually. <laughs> yep. So yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Thank you for being with us. It, I'm going to wrap My it up pleasure. here. Do you, do you have any closing thoughts on addiction or anything like that? Anything you want people to take away from this kind of it, the main it, point? There is treatment. There really is treatment available, and there's so much money available in this country for addiction. Um, there's so many, so many facilities in our county accept public subsidies. Um, that that all the person has to do is say, I'm, I'm low income, I can't afford it. Um, you know, Pyramid, which is a rehab in, Mar excuse me, in, in uh, Hamilton, you know, is 99% of all their patients are Medicaid, you know, and uh, we used to be work the streets of Atlantic City, a group of us that was trying to reduce the number of opioid dependent people. So we walked in some really blighted areas of Atlantic City at nighttime and ran across a lot of people literally with needles in their arms. So the, the county was able to let me use a cab service to get people into treatment. So we were able to get them on Medicaid pretty quickly and then had them transported by cab to the, to, uh, to, to the rehab in Hamilton. And then at that point, they would they begin to like a 21 day stay of detoxing and rehab. But the money was there through Medicaid. But, you know, you, you, you have to spend about an hour with that person just to get the Medicaid application going. And once you do, yes. you know, they're, they're good for a couple of years. All so right, so that's a facility like Atlantic Care, you know, they'll they'll do the application for you. Yes, and that's you know, sales help with applications. You know, there's I get that's a great takeaway. There are resources yeah. out there. You just have to yeah. avail yourself of it. And uh, there is help out there. There are options that you have. There are. All you right, don't well have thank to you. Suffer. Thank you, John, for joining us. This was great. And I really learned a lot. So thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Bye, everybody. Until next time.